We spoke about a whole range of topics. Some of the slides will repeat in this presentation, but we'll try to keep it interesting. This is a shorter presentation. We have more time for questions and for practical topics. We will not get much into mantras, tantras, yantras, and all the practical details because that is best done on the street with a local person who knows the scene, what to say, how to act, etc. We'll mainly deal with the principle, but once you know the principle, you can figure out the details because you're the smart ones, okay? That's why we pay you the big bucks because you're intelligent, you can understand the difference between a principle and a detail. A principle never changes. The principle always stays the same. Just like utility is the principle, purity is the force, books are the basis, and preaching is the essence. These are principles that Srila Prabhupada has given us. Now how does it apply in my situation, in my life? That's time, place, circumstance. That's a detail that will always change. Details always change. Most of the problems in our lives come because we confuse details and principles. We take details to be as very important and we forget about principles. And that's where the trouble comes from. And the second one, if you're already with causing trouble to ourselves and others, is, is having unrealistic expectation towards yourself or towards others. That they're not capable or willing to fulfill. So we have to be realistic. Haribo, friend. Thank you. So, without further ado, we're going to get started here. These are five simple things that each and every one of us can do to increase book distribution. So, instead of talking, big talk about philosophy, strategy, etc., let's just start where we are and see what we can do to increase book distribution. I've heard that now in Croatia, on an average, they do 7,000 books. I think we can do better than that. What do you think? Prophets books. Yes, prophets books. Seven thousand. There's more. Yeah, yeah. There's more, but that's the ones that we count. Okay. <laughs> because that's the ones Prabhupada cares about. That's what he wants to know. He doesn't want to know how much turnover you got in your business, how much money you're spending. When Prabhupada comes to this place and Prabhupada is here, he wants to know how many of my books did you distribute last year? And if you say seven thousand, then he will say, hmm. Okay. Can you do like twice as much? Can you double it? What do you think? We saw the scores yesterday. How small little temples with zero resident devotees, all congregation, increased by 600% over a period of just two or three years. Just by getting congregation involved in book distribution. So, that was the introduction. Without further ado, we get started. So the five simple things they are here, desire, vision, strategy, follow-up, and mood. We'll focus on these five topics because I find them to be very crucial for actually getting some traction, for getting some movement, for going anywhere. A lot of times we just spin our wheels, but we're not really moving because we're not grounded. We're not really on the ground. We're just on the mental platform. Manor, Tena, Satidava, Tobahi. And thus a lot of air, hot air is produced. And it doesn't amount to much substance. So the first thing is always desire. Everything starts with desire. Just like you're sitting here because you had a desire. Okay, maybe you know this guy, Navina, or you heard about book distribution, or you just figured it's time to go to the temple again. But you had a desire. Without a desire, nothing happens. You don't even get out of bed if you don't have a desire to do it. Most people, they don't, you know, till late. So. <laughs> It's all based on desire. Desire is a seed which grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. A couple of months ago I was in Angkor Wat, Cambodia, and this is a picture taken there from a very famous temple, the biggest Vishnu temple in the world. There's actually four or five hundred temples that were built on that whole area over several hundreds of years. And as you can see, a lot of it is ruins, a lot of it is destroyed, it's under heritage, it's being now different governments have taken charge of different projects and they're getting things again together. But you can see, it's a big tree there, on top of a temple. Huh? 
A couple of years ago, one of the projects that I'm involved with in my court, we had a water damage on the fourth floor. On the fourth floor, we had a water damage. And I said, but it's not possible because there's no piping going through the roof there. Why do we have a water damage all of a sudden? So I went up on the roof on the fourth floor and what did I see? I saw a tree about six feet tall on top of the roof of that school, of that building. Now how did that tree get there? Well, a bird ate a fruit and flew and passed, you know, the seed with the stool and some water and some air and boom, there is a tree. And the roots were going about 30 feet in each direction and right through the concrete, this much concrete, and caused a huge water damage in our roof. So, in other words, seeds are very powerful. So check your roof daily to make sure that there's no weeds growing. Because otherwise, all of a sudden, you may have big damage in your life. Desire, uh, bija, is also compared to a seed. You know this analogy of cleansing the heart from unwanted things, from dust, but also from unwanted desires, who will occupy our bhakti garden and choke our creeper of devotion. So as bhakti practitioners, we have to visit our garden regularly. Sundarana Prabhu, who is doing gardening, he says that, you know, at least a couple of times a week you have to show up and you have to make sure that your garden is okay. You can't just put the seed and then say, okay, I'll come back to harvest in six months. You will not notice what is seed and what is... <laughs> And, and what is actually weeds. You will confuse one for the other. So in the same way in our own lives, we have to visit our bhakti garden on a daily basis to practice our sadhana, our hearing and chanting in the association of devotees. Otherwise, all of a sudden, we think that the Kama beach, the Jnana beach, the Kroda beach, you know, that these are actually beautiful plants. But our bhakti beach is choked, it's finished, it's gone. So, Srila Prabhupada mentioned when the devotees asked him about going out and teaching and training others about preaching and book distribution, don't just teach him techniques, but teach him how to be sincere. Sincere comes from the word sincerus, or without wax. Because the artisans, when they used to make those marble sculptures, when there was cracks, and holes, they would patch them up with wax. So, an artist who was sincere was a person who was not putting wax in his creation, in his productions. So in the same way, Srila Prabhupada is asking us to be sincere. That means without any uh, wax, no ulterior motives. In front of the Guru and Krishna, we are standing and our anarchists are exposed. So sometimes that's a little discouraging, especially when you go out preaching and people tell you straight in the face, why are you so pushy? You know? Or why aren't you a little more assertive? You know, people give you that feedback straight up. And it may be a little surprising, a little shocking. One time I was in Australia in front of a mall and I had a polo shirt on, you know those with the neck? And it was buttoned up because it was kind of big, so it was buttoned up. And there's a couple that came and they said, this doesn't look comfortable, you have to open this button. <laughs> I said, okay, fair enough. And I opened the button and then they bought the book, you know. But people will tell you all kinds of things on the street that sometimes you might or might not be willing to hear. And a lot of times it's Krishna speaking through them, giving us... Uh, giving us what we need to hear. Srila Prabhupada mentioned that there is sufficient merit in our books. If you simply describe them sincerely to anyone, they will buy. So it is not about creating, fabricating stories, making up so many things. I know it's possible. You can tell people, we're coming from here and we're going over there and take the book and give me some money. And many of us have done it with quite some success. But not only does the person in the evening think, hmm, he told me, we're coming from over here, we're going over there, give me some money, and now I'm stuck with this book. What happened? 
But also, at the end of the day, you have to be able to live with yourself. You know? You can't just rattle off meaningless things. So to learn how to speak from the books is very helpful. And for that, you have to read the books. And there's enough information, there's enough merit and content in Prabhupada's books that if we simply describe them sincerely, people will be attracted and they will want to read the books. Just like, can anybody give me an example? What would be a line which would pretty much come from Prabhupada's books that we can use? Anything. I'll tell you a story. When we first got the big first answer, yeah. by Shanshi Kapapu and other devotees, they would go out there and they would say this famous verse, which is the seed verse. Krishna is an Avapagate, Dhamma Bhisma. They would just wrap up the whole verse. And it's this Bhagavatam says, brilliant as the sun. It's the risen after the departure of Lord Krishna. It says they would wrap up the whole verse and the whole translation and they would hand it right the book and maybe they would just buy it based on that. And so people took it. Yeah. Because you can't argue with the truth. Because <laughs> Because it's the truth. <laughs> if you just speak the truth, people won't actually find fault with you. So, it's quite an experience. Try it out. We all have our favorite verses, our favorite shlokas, our favorite lines. So, use those and see how, how much. These are mantras. You know, Battle of Kurukshetra was primarily conducted with mantras. I mean, there was infantry and other kinds of... But the Maharatis, the ones who were actually having a major impact. They were using mantras. They were using special astras, which they released by the power of mantra. So if we learn the art of projecting transcendental sound vibration coming from the Bhagavatam, you can have a major impact in people's lives. And of course it is all based on our Sincerity of chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Because the Maha Mantra is that mantra which ultimately all the other mantras culminate in that mantra. And that's where the potency comes from. So if you want to describe the books, then we have to read the books. Because people will ask us, what does it say there in your book? And we should have an idea. So about desire, what are the action points? To choose our sangha, our association. Because desires, they're like germs, you know, they, they kind of stick with you. They, they rub off on you. Whichever association we're with, that's the kind of mindset and desires that we acquire. So we should choose our sangha carefully. We have choices every given day of the week how we like to associate, where do we invest our time and our emotions. And to water our bhakti plan daily by strict sadhana. To root out the weeds, the unwanted weeds, those creepers that are choking, that are diminishing our progress in spiritual life. And to check your roof and your heart on a regular basis to make sure that there is nothing there that will cause uh, disturbance. What do you mean by root? Roof. The roof. <laughs> I'll show you why we mentioned the roof. Because we spoke about the desire that is a seed which grows and grows and grows. And I told the story how we had a water damage on the fourth floor of a building because there was a tree growing on the roof. So if we're not careful, then the roof, you know, can mean not just the roof of our house, but also our, our head. We may get so many ideas because people have put ideas in our head that have started to grow and sprout into something undesirable. Whatever I had to say, I've already said in my books. Now you must all try to understand it and continue with your endeavors. So Srila Prabhupada has left us a ample wealth of knowledge in his books. There is so much substance and so much information and so much inspiration in Prabhupada's books that if you read Prabhupada's books, 
There is no way of how not to feel inspired to go out and share this with others. I don't know how you feel, but when I read Prophet's books, I just feel like, okay, now I want to go out. I want to give this to other people because this is really the best thing that, that has actually uh, happened in my life. To walk and reflect daily. Sometimes we're too busy working. We're just really zoomed in and we're really absorbed in what we're doing. But sometimes we need to take a little break from what we're doing to analyze and to see is it actually working? Is it actually effective? But you know, Prabhupada also, he went on a morning walk. And he did that, practically speaking, on a daily basis. Walking is also good for physical exercise, it's good to process, and it's good to jan chapa. So, I regularly go and walk, chant Hare Krishna, sometimes with a mentor, sometimes with a friend. So, vision. We discussed yesterday the seven purposes of ISKCON. And book distribution and outreach is very much part of the seven purposes of ISKCON. <coughs> to systematically propagate spiritual knowledge to society at large, to propagate Krishna con consciousness of Krishna as it's revealed in Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. And then the seventh one, that you can achieve the six aforementioned purposes simply by the publishing and the distribution of periodicals, books and other writings. This Krishna Conscious Movement has been started, it has been built, it has been sustained on the publishing and on the distribution of transcendental literature. Especially the books of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktad and the Swami Prabhupada. In fact, in many countries the movement has solely started on books. Nobody went there, just the books went there and somebody started reading and practicing. So this we already had yesterday. I just have it in this presentation also. This is my request. Print as many books in as many languages and distribute throughout the whole world and Krishna consciousness movement will automatically increase. This is from a famous class in Los Angeles in 1975. So you have the wonderful opportunity that you just got gifted a new language, you know, a few years back. Croatian just emerged. So now we can do all of Prophet's books in Croatian language. What's our plan? <coughs> to produce these books. I mean, I'd be, if I'd be living here, I'd be very excited to be part of this effort to produce Prabhupada's books in Croatian language. So you're very fortunate. Before that opportunity was not there. The books were already done in several Croatian, and now uh, you have this opportunity. So Srila Prabhupada made this request I want that all of you, my students, shall vigorously try for book distribution. Vigorously. What does vigor mean, vigorously? Archita Prabhu? It means with, with energy, not just, not just going through the motion. Not just going through the motion, but putting your heart into it. Yes. Applying yourself with Shakti, putting your full force into it. We have to use our energy for Krishna. If our energy is not expanded for propagating the Krishna consciousness movement, Maya will, stay, will steal away that energy. And it will be just misused. It will be wasted. Simply by this attempt, you get superior strength and knowledge about Krishna consciousness. Sometimes we feel we're not knowledgeable, or we're lacking that strength. But by the attempt to go out and preach and distribute books, that... Uh, attempt will create a superior strength and knowledge. So last year it was mentioned, ISKCON did 8 million books all over the world globally and we crossed the half a billion mark, 502 million distributed books. And that is the biggest score since 1995. So that's very wonderful. It's quite an achievement. Now, just to put it into perspective, have you heard of the Gideons? It's a Christian society of business people. Last year, they distributed 80 million books. 10 million in the US, but 80 million globally. That's 10 times as much 
as ISKCON has done. And that's just one Christian society. That's not the Catholics, that's not this one, that one, that's just one Christian publishing house. They're active in most of the countries, in many, many languages, and they only have 176,000 members. They're all congregation. There is not one clergyman. There's not one priest or one church administrator in their organization. And 60% is done to students. Formerly, they were almost entirely in hotels and motels. And now they're primarily targeting students. So we can see what other organizations do and we can learn from them. So how do we do this? How do we actually go about doing this? Well, it requires a lot of people. And they all do a little bit. Just like here, we got about 30 people, 30 plus people. So you might say 30 people, that's not much. But we mentioned yesterday, book a day keeps my away. If each and every one of us does 30 books a month, which is quite doable, we made the calculation. That's, you know, that's a thousand books a month. Just by the people here, sitting here in this room, that's 12,000 books a year. That's almost twice as many books as the entire country of Croatia did last year. So, it's doable, just by little effort of a lot of people. Just like putting Bhagavad Gita's in different hotels. It's quite feasible, it's possible to do it. If you want to find out more, motelgita.org gives you all the information. To date they have placed about 200,000 Bhagavad Gita's in the U.S. alone and Canada. And there's much more scope for that activity, even here in Croatia. So as action points, we get our vision from Guru Sadhu and Shastra. You know the cars, they have GPS, we have GSS, Guru Sadhu Shastra. <laughs> it's not enough to just say, I have a clear signal with Guru. Well, when did you see him last time? Oh, that was, you know, eight years ago. Or, no. You also, if you want to have a geographically defined location, you need a clear signal from three satellites. In the same way, Guru Sadhu Shastra. It's not just enough to read the books. You also need practitioners. You need devotees who are giving you feedback. And you need to be aligned with the Parampara, with the disciplic succession. And to choose our priorities. Very often we don't achieve a goal, not because that goal is unrealistic or it's, there's too many obstacles, but because we are going for the lower hanging fruit. We're going for the easy engagement. Have you ever had tasks to do, but you got caught up with so many little distracting things that were just easier to do? Okay, let me check email, SMS, messages, do this, do that, talk to this one, talk to that one. And the real job never got done. So to choose our priorities, to align ourselves, with Srila Prabhupada's desire, with the desire of the Parampara. And to broaden our mindset. Sometimes we get very disturbed and worked up about details because we do not understand the scope of Srila Prabhupada's mission. And how do we broaden our mindset? By studying Krishna's words in the Bhagavad Gita. Because Krishna, everything is resting on Krishna. So, he has got an unlimitedly expansive mind. So if we read Krishna's teachings, and we study them carefully, then our mind will also become broader, will become broad-minded. That doesn't mean liberal. It means we have a philosophical, a broad mind, which is very much required if we want to actually preach. Strategy. By printing the books, we can inject the movement into the masses of the people all over the world. We mentioned yesterday that our preaching, people will forget it. It's just a matter of reality. People forget words very fast. But if they have something written that they can check back on, that stays with them, that will remind them, then that is actually of lasting importance. I know a devotee from Denmark, he got a book 
And he kept it, and after 17 years, he read the book and he became a devotee. Sometimes the people may just not be ready at that exact moment. But the books are always ready. They're always available. They're like good friends. They stay with people in the apartments, on the shelf. They're there. We're going. We're moving. We're not going to stick with the people. But the books, they will stay behind. So we spoke about the goose that lays the golden eggs. Everybody wants to see great results and great achievements, but what are we ready to do in order to achieve those results? Just like the BBT needs cash flow, they need uh, activity in order to print books. That's why Srila Prabhupada set up the BBT and ISKCON, and <clears throat> ISKCON is the beneficiary of the BBT. Right? Is that correct? That's right. That's the right word. Thank you. And all printing of ISKCON literature must be done by the BBT or under BBT sanction and approval. If temples print independently or individuals print independently, it will be at the cost of the books that I am myself printing and could eventually cause the financial ruin of the BBT. This is a very clear instruction from Srila Prabhupada. Now we see not just in Croatia but in many parts of the world People are getting ideas and they're thinking, well, let me just cook up my own little book, you know. I copy something from here, something from there, mix in a little something from here, put in my own little spicing and, you know, shake it nicely. And, and it's cheap. And it's what I like. And I don't have to deal with anybody. But in this way, we'll be cheating ourselves primarily. Because we're trying to cut out Prabhupada, the BBT, is gone, and eventually... <laughs> We're just shooting ourselves in the foot. It doesn't work because we're cutting ourselves off. We're detaching ourselves from the mercy. Just like if you take this out, then there's just nothing moving anymore. Now I may hold it very close and I might say, I'm, I'm connected to ISKCON, you know? I'm very close to the devotees, but if I'm just two fingers apart, there's no connection. I'm not plugged in. There's no juice, there's no current flowing. So we have to be very careful that we don't fall into this trap. And this is not just for printing books, but this is also for feeling ourselves uh, independent. We should feel spiritually dependent. And materially, if you're a householder, you can live your own independent life. But spiritually, we should feel very much dependent on Prabhupada, on Prabhupada's instruction on this movement. If you simply push on this one activity of distributing my books, your all success will be there. I've hatched this transcendental plot for getting money by selling books. And if we stick only to this plan and use our brain for selling books, there will easily be enough money. Today's Holiness Prabhupada Swami mentioned that when he was president in different temples in the, in the U.S. in the early days, because he would organize book distribution in Harinam, there was always a surplus of funds just by engaging in the activity of book distribution. And we have seen also here in Croatia that in the times when book distribution was flourishing, a lot of projects were flourishing. Temples were built, projects were done, and everything. There was an abundance mentality. So when book distribution stops, then the scarcity mentality moves in. Oh, why is he doing that? Oh, why is he spending that like that? So Prabhupada has hatched this transcendental plot. If we just stick to the formula, there's no need to reinvent the wheel or to change the formula. Prabhupada has already given us the formula. So the action points, to think with our own head. It means how can I apply this? How can I apply the formula in my own life? How does it translate for me? Krishna consciousness is not a stereotype, it's not copy-paste. So, to see how we can apply this, we need to use our own God-given intelligence and to plan diligently, to make a plan. Planning to fail is failing to plan. I know we have all, each and every one of us, we have a very clear plan about so many things in life. I know I will eat two meals a day. I've made up my mind. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I've made up my mind. 
So many things we plan, but what about preaching? What about engaging in this most important activity? Do we have a plan for it? Or do we think, oh, if it happens, fine. If not, also fine. So what is our plan? So we ask you please, this week and this weekend, sit down and make your plan. It's 2014, it's already middle of April. A third of the year practically is gone. Do I have a plan? Do I have an idea? Do I have a desire? Just take it back to the source and then work step by step. And it takes a little bit of training where a person is careful recruiting, sometimes there's this attitude that everybody should be engaged <coughs> in book distribution. And I agree, but there are some exceptions. Some people should not distribute books because it's not good for them and it's not good for the public. But it's very rare, few exceptions. For the most part, devotees are nice, they're representable, and they can engage in book distribution. But there has to be regular training. Formally, you just say, okay, here are the books and there are the people and, you know, go figure it out. Well, what should I say? Oh, you know, Hari Bo, I'll see you at 8 o'clock tonight. <laughs> Do your quota, Prabhu, you know. And some felt overwhelmed. They felt just overwhelmed. So we should have workshops, we should have training sessions. And those who are more experienced, please take a little time to give guidance and to share your realization and knowledge with others. Srila Prabhupada was so happy to see the senior preachers and book distributors train others. I know I was in Vrindavan in the mid-90s after Govardhan Parikrama, we went to visit Budimanta Prabhu, who was living at the ground bottom of Krishna Balaram guest house. He had a room there, he was in his last few months. And he was telling us, me and Harinamananda Prabhu, how one time he got back from Sankirtan and he just showered and put on a dhoti and he didn't wear any kurta and he just went into Prabhupada's darshan in Los Angeles and he just paid dandavat and Prabhupada saw he had no kurta and he had his assistant go to his almira and pick up a kurta and Prabhupada gave him his own kurta. Would you like to get Prabhupada's kurta? <laughs> yes. You can still get Prabhupada's kurta today here in Zagreb when you engage in book distribution and in preaching. And Prabhupada just stopped the conversation and just asked him, how was Sankirtan? How was book distribution? And started talking to him. He was so happy, he was so pleased. And then he was laughing and laughing and he said, I was just doing a few books and Prabhupada gave me his shirt. You are doing thousands of books. What would Prabhupada give you? And then later on, he left this world in Vrindavan in a very auspicious way and we heard it was on Shivaratri. And on that day, everybody had the biggest day on Sankirtan. We didn't know why. People were just throwing money at us. Have you ever had days like that? Where people just, they just throw money at you and just take books. It's like, I remember to this day, I did 255 Mahabig and Big Books, two Bhagavatam set, one CC set. It was not a marathon, not even on the street. I was going door to door. But the books were flying, and we didn't know why. And later on, we found out why. Because it's that day when Bodhimanta left this world. So Krishna said, Prophet said, today, nobody can refuse. Because Bodhimanta gave his life for book distribution. So today, Everybody will get a book. Nobody can say no. <laughs> they just all took the books. And it was just, it was crazy. So to assess and improve daily. To assess, to see how am I doing. It's difficult because we're not that objective. So we need each other to go out in teams and groups and to get that feedback so we can improve. And that means keeping our eyes and our ears open. Then follow-up is a topic that I would like to speak a little bit more about because, let's face it, in ISKCON, we are number one in the world for first contact. There is nobody, there is no movement who is as, what's the right word, audacious? 
audacious? Is that the right word? We are very forthcoming. He's in your face. Yeah, we're we're out there. Let's put it that way. We're out there, doing Harinam, doing book distribution, doing programs, meeting people in all the possible and impossible venues. So people are they they see us. There's an exposure. But when it comes to actually cultivation and harvesting the fruits of our preaching, I don't know where we stand on the scale, on the charter. I don't want to give ourselves a grade because it's difficult to do that. So let's speak on the positive. When you plan the outreach, plan the follow-up. Just like when you put seeds, you plant, you also plant the harvesting. Isn't it, Sundar? You plan the harvest, right? Sometimes you forget that. Sometimes you don't have time for that. You don't have time to harvest. But then what happens? The crop just spoils. It just rots. And it goes into the ground. Or some animals come and eat it. Or some other people come and pick it up. That's what's happening. Other groups will come and they will say, Oh, very nice. You're doing the preaching. And we're getting the result. That's wonderful. We like you people a lot. So we should plan the outreach. And we should plan the follow-up. Just like Mayapur, this for me, it's a little dark here on this projector, but Mayapur is a very fertile area because it gets flooded and there's, you know, Ganges is all around. And they do three harvests of rice every year. Farmers are feeling quite secure. They're not insecure people because they know that I will harvest. So in the same way, if we learn the art of cultivation and follow-up, then that will actually close the circle. We will not just expand energy, but we will also be getting back energy from our endeavors. But it has to be done in a systematic way. So these are five simple steps for follow-up. To set yourself goals. Because goals are potent. What are our goals? How many programs do we want to have? How many sanghas are there in this area? How can we increase the outreach? To define our offers, like how many public programs, what venues, what programs, what type of outreach do we want to have? What is our interaction with the universities, with the student class? What festivals are we holding in a year? This can be planned. And then, I know it sounds simplistic, but it's very often overlooked. Carry a paper and a pen and get people's contact information. When you meet a nice person who is interested, take their name, take their mobile phone number, and take their email. And then you go home and you throw it away, right? No. You put it in the database. You have somebody who is database manager who is keeping the database? That position should be created so that the information is going out to all the interested people. So, and then you have it in your database and with one click you know who is interested in what and you can invite these different groups for different types of programs. It means to assign roles and arrange resources just like the phone answering service. You know that if nobody picks up the phone or the line is busy, it's the right number. So, people are calling here, but sometimes nobody picks up. I know from personal experience. Sometimes people show up, but there is nobody there to actually take care of them. As happened many times in our temples. People just walk around and, and then they leave. So, to implement and measure our success, so these are five simple steps for follow-up. And it's a teamwork, it's a team effort. It means, for instance, that somebody in the temple carries a phone. It can be a mobile phone, it can be a wireless, but carries that phone where the regular incoming calls are coming onto that phone. Are you doing that here? Or is it just ringing in the kitchen somewhere? And if nobody's, or in the office? And if nobody's there, well, that's what it is. Nobody's going to answer the phone. It's not rocket science. It's not like, you know, going to Mars or something. It has been done before by other people. 
just like in a company. I mean, you make sure you have a receptionist, right? You make sure you have a phone operator who, who answers the calls and directs them in a way, and they know how to take a message and to pass it on to the right person. These are kind of simple things, but we have to make sure that it's happening in our centers. Otherwise, we will lose out on the harvest. Because people, I have met so many who got books, and then they called, and there was no one there, and they thought, okay, it's a nice book, but, but, but that's it. There's nobody there on the other side. They don't exist. And it wasn't until months or years later, until they met a devotee, and they just figured out, well, you know, they just weren't that organized. There's so many countless stories like that. And let's face it, honestly speaking, in many places we have done everything we could to keep people away. We've tried hard, and still they keep coming back. <laughs> so, we shouldn't make it too difficult <laughs> for them. <laughs> you know? But it's a team effort. Just like in a hotel. I don't know how many of you go to hotels, but you know, I distribute books and on the streets and you see those good hotels. And what do they have? They have a person outside in a frock who is just the front man. He's just, what are, what are they called? Dorman. Dorman. He's just, his job is just to greet people. That's all he does. Hello. Welcome to the Waldorf. Hello. Welcome to the Hyatt. Hare Krishna. Welcome to the Hare Krishna Center here in Zagreb. Just to, just to see a smiling face who greets you. That's something, you know what? A lot of people come back just because that person was so friendly. It's the little things that make the difference. But it takes teamwork. It takes cooks who keep prashada for people who come late. That there's always something for guests. There's always some more prashada. There's never the situation where there's just nothing. It's teamwork. So action points is see the need and do it. Wherever there's a need, we should fulfill it. Move. The prime directive is to leave everybody with a good impression. And we should be careful to encourage the spirit of enthusiastic service, which is individual, spontaneous, and voluntary. We spoke about this yesterday, so we're not going to get into it today. The motto is better service, always better service. Krishna was not only washing Sudama Vipra's feet, <coughs> he was washing the feet of everybody who came to the Raja Suya sacrifice of Mara Judistir. How many people attended the Raja Suya sacrifice? How many people attended that Raja Suya sacrifice? Hundreds, hundreds and thousands. A lot of people, yes, that's correct. So, we're in the service industry. Our title is Das and Devi Dasi. So, we should not have a problem with offering service. When I get a contact, after three days, I write them an email message or an SMS, and I tell them, it was very nice to meet you. I hope you enjoy the book. Thank you for your time. And if there's anything that I can do to assist you on your spiritual path, please do let me know. I would be delighted to hear from you. 80% of the people write me back. Some of them I stay in contact with. Most of them I turn them over to the local center, to the local temple. So they develop some contact with a local person. Because, you know, it's difficult when you keep on traveling. But in every center you have devotees who are very friendly and very outgoing and available so but the first contact has to be made by the person who actually met them otherwise they feel weird oh i met this this nice person and all of a sudden this company is writing to me this corporate letter you know about fundraising or about some some event or some festival and they go like yeah but i met I met Joe, you know, and now, and now the corporate head office is asking me whether I want to buy shares in their company or stocks, you know, and they feel this is, this is weird. 
So we have to make sure that that experience that they got when they first met a devotee, that there's continuity in that. And then later on, you can turn it over. Maybe when they come to the temple, or when you see that this person is maybe not, you know, you're not capable of dealing with this person. Like if you're a brahmachari or prabhu and it's a lady, you want to turn her over to the ladies as, as, as fast as possible. Or if you're elderly and it's a very young person who is just on a totally different mindset like that, or somebody from an academic background who has very academic needs. So you know who can relate to what type of people. So we're in the service business. And the mood is to feel ourselves as Krishna's instruments. We're not going out there to impress anybody. We're just trying to be the instruments of Krishna. To remain humble and hungry. And to go out for self-purification. Sankirtan is the primary way of how to get purified. Trinata Pisa Nichena Tarori Vasahishnana Amani Namanadina Kirtaniya Sadahari. This humility is developed by the process of Harinam Sankirtan. And to save one soul at a time, beginning with ourselves. Have you ever seen this in the airlines when you fly? First you put the mask on yourself before you help, you know, infants or other passengers. Satyadev Prabhu, who was a paramedic for the uh, San Francisco Fire Department, he said that their motto was, you know when you call 911, when you call some accident or some, these are the ones who go out when there's road accidents or other types of things, emergency relief. And he said their motto was, you have to come home alive. Don't put yourself into danger. Because a dead paramedic is no help to anybody. So we have to know our own limitations also. Sometimes devotees just go out and do dangerous things, do things that put their health or their spiritual health into jeopardy. They go to places which are not conducive. Like sometimes devotees get very excited. Oh, there's these nightclubs and these special parties. And you know, there's a lot of young people. But then they get bewildered by the environment. So we have to know how much we can handle, how much we can take. Like I know in India sometimes they distribute books at the stoplights where the cars are. And there's a lot of exhaust, you know, they're out in the smoke and in the heat. And it's very heavy. It's a very rough environment. So you have to know how much you can take physically, psychologically and spiritually. You have to know your limitations. That's why every professional, every sports person has got a trainer. They've got somebody there who makes sure that the, that the athlete is okay. So to leave everybody with a good impression, here are some simple things that often are under, overlooked or underestimated. To just offer kind words. Just like sometimes it's hard to get people to stop. Have you ever had the experience that it's hard to stop people? They just don't stop, they're just too busy, they just brush you off, they just run by. One very simple and easy technique to stop people is to just offer kind words. Just like for instance, what kind of kind words can you offer people as an introduction? Are you feeling good today? How are you doing today? These are kind words. And people pick up on them. Hello, today for all the best dressed people, we're showing these books. You know, you give them a little compliment. For all the hard working people, for all the smart people, for all the intelligent people. Like that. It's not so complicated. But sometimes we overlook it, we overestimate it. We just Expressing sincere gratitude. Thank you for being out here today. Thank you for looking at these books. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for showing some interest. I found that the thank you is the most powerful way 
of how to get people to open up. All of a sudden, they they just they can't refuse because you showed them some gratitude. Preaching means giving. We're not going out there to take something from people. Prabhupada just gave, 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 gave. He was doing everything by himself. And at one point, one person asked him whether they can help with cleaning the floor and the pots. The Prophet said, I thought nobody would ever ask. Well, he was ready to just go on doing it till somebody picked up that maybe I could also help out. Not to be condescending. It's a very important one. Sometimes we get self-righteous. We're riding high and holy on our horse because we have the holy scripture and we are carrying the holy grail. But because of our attitude and because of our ego and arrogance, we make it impossible for people to appreciate. We make it impossible for them to actually accept the message. So not to be condescending. It's always much better to take a humble position and to, to just <coughs> deal with people on equal ground or even, you know, to put yourself a little down. It's much more accessible for people than when we are speaking from a high elevated platform. To express real empathy means to actually care for people. Now, how do you express empathy? Can somebody give me an example? All right? Listen to people what they say. Wow. That sounds scary. <laughs> to actually listen to people what they say. <laughs> Has it ever happened to you that you just did not listen to the other party and because of that they could not relate, they did not want to deal with you because there was just not that openness to listen. Very important point. We see when we hear Prabhupada's lectures so many times People at the end, they just rattle and rattle and rattle and rattle and rattle and rattle. The prophet is so patient. And then he gives them, once they're, then he gives them the, the answer. So I know on book distribution it's difficult. We have to choose sometimes like that, bring things to a point. But when we're actually listening, it makes such a difference on people. What are other ways of how to express empathy that you find to be very useful, that you find to be powerful? To be concerned. How do you show that? Um, to, to be able to relate to their reality or their Okay. Things. I ask everybody, I ask everybody, what do you work or what do you study? And then I ask them a follow-up, a second question, you know, whether they like their job or their studies, whether they're good at it, like that. You actually show some interest in them. And all of a sudden, they're interested in your book. All of a sudden. Why? Because you showed interest in them. Yeah. Practice reflective listening. And make people feel special, because they are. Everybody is a part and parcel of Krishna. Every living entity is special. Everybody counts. So becoming an ambassador of goodwill, we're representing not our own selves. We're representing Srila Prabhupada, the Guru Parampara, and Krishna. People won't say, oh, you know, Marco was, was a nasty fellow. They will say the Hare Krishnas are not very nice people. So it will not reflect on us individually, but they will project it towards the movement. Just like if you're the ambassador of Croatia to the United States of America, you'll be sitting in Washington, and everybody will be watching you. Okay, what is he doing? How is he talking? Where does he go out? How does he shop? How does he eat? Etc. People will watch you. And in the same way, devotees, people know that these are high Krishnas. They know. So they're watching. So we have to lead an exemplary life. And it means doing selfless service. 
Devotional service is absolute. Whether we clean the floor, we cut the potatoes, we take out the trash, or we preach and distribute books, or we worship the deities. Now, of course, we know that preaching is the highest service and it's of utmost importance. But it doesn't mean we cannot engage in the other activities as well. And sometimes in the past this has been underestimated or overlooked sometimes. And thus there was an elitist attitude and a separation, a distinction amongst devotees as groups. And it's created to some unhealthy <coughs> schisms, some unhealthy uh, developments in yatras. So to do what is needed, Action points to imbibe Srila Prabhupada's mood, which means to study his life and his teachings and to follow his example, to invest into people. The devotees are our greatest asset. People are investing into infrastructure, they're investing into this and that and the other thing, but are we actually investing into people? How do we invest into people? Can somebody name me some ways of how we invest into all right? Trainer. Trainer. By training. That's the primary way of investing. Equipping them with the not necessary knowledge, skills, and attitudes required to do their services properly. When I started book distribution, there was no training program. It was just you go out and sink or swim. And a lot of people sank. They, they didn't come back. So. To actually train the devotees for their services. I know if I tell you, you have to cook Raja Boga offering tomorrow, how many of you would be confident to do it? Very few. I know almost everybody in this room can do it if you get a little training. But without the necessary training, ooh, wow. You know? It's. It's quite a demand. And actually it's insensitive on the part of the leadership to expect people to do services that they're not trained for. So we should invest in people. And it also means investing time into devotee relationships that we actually build devotee relationships and we spend the time necessary to give the training to do the assessment, to hear people out, and to help them to do their service better, to perform better in their devotional service. Then creating a good impression, cultivating service attitude, everybody counts, and ultimately Krishna is the doer and the enjoyer of all activities. There are no winners and losers because Paramijayate is Sri Krishna Sankirtan. Everybody who goes and engages in the Sankirtan movement, they are going to be part of that success. Because when Krishna is pleased, everybody becomes pleased. Now here are the five little takeaways. These are the five big topics. Now it's five little takeaways, five little things that we all can do. Always carry books with you. We spoke about this yesterday. Have some of you thought about how to do this? Is it possible to always carry books on you? Always have a few small books or one Bhagavad Gita, you know, in the car, in your handbag, in your purse. Is this doable? What do you think? Yes. Yeah? So, can we start working on this in the next few days? Because once you start thinking about Sankirtan, Krishna is going to send you those people. But then you need to have the books. To set up book tables. I'm sure somebody's doing here in the temple on the weekend, right? No? Okay. You'll see it's very powerful. If you just have a book table in the temple room, right next to the speaker, Sunday feast class, just have the full set there. And so many books get sold just by making them visible. Placing smart boxes is another one. So many shops which would be very happy to carry a few of Prophet's books. It can be done. It has been done in many places successfully. And to distribute full sets. Now, of course, here we could say we have to first produce the full set. 
And each one teach one. Each and every one of the devotees, each and every one of us that's sitting here in this room, we know something. So whatever it is that we have realized, we can teach it to somebody else. There are many resources on the web. You mentioned yesterday, Jai Shishigorita. 